The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and religion. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they'd been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Kevin Wardelli, political consultant who's run a lot of campaigns in New York City. Glad to have you with us today, Kevin. Thank you very much for having me, Dr. Brown. Well, this is, uh, you know, the end of 09, the beginning of 10. Yes. Uh, you've done a lot of campaigns. The, the election season for 09 is over. Yes, sir. The results are in. What's your impression about what happened in terms of the liberal Democratic minority coalitions as a result of the 2009 election? Well, I, I think 2009 was, a, 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 was truly a watermark year. Mm -hmm. uh, for that so-called minority and liberal coalition. Um, mm -hmm. I think John Liu's election and the election of Bill de Blasio sent messages throughout the city that the demographics were changing, that the politics was changing, and that true coalition politics is still alive. Now tell uh, us what positions for the uh, uninformed or the oh, ones yes, who are not yes, paid that much attention to this, <laughs> although many of them did vote, although the voting was very, very low. It was very, very low. It was very low. Well, John Liu, um, is the new comptroller for the city of New York, the first Asian American elected to hold citywide office, as he was the first Asian to hold uh, office in the city council. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill de Blasio uh, will be, is the first public advocate. It was the first new public advocate in the new modern uh, 2000 era, following Mark Green and Betsy Gottbaum. Um, and uh, so I think both those elections, because both de Blasio and Lou put together the very distinct coalitions. Mm -hmm. Um, using labor, using African Americans and Latinos, using progressive whites, mm -hmm. um, to stitch together a coalition in very crowded fields. I mean, when you think about it, uh, John Lou faced, people, yeah. yeah, John Lou faced, uh, was in a four-way race, and de Blasio f was in another four-way race uh, against candidates that many folks thought uh, were going to be able to, to overcome both of them. I mean, de Blasio ran against Mark Green, who was mm -hmm. the most famous public advocate, the mm -hmm. first public advocate, um, who had a good record as public advocate. Mm -hmm. Whether you loved him or hated him, mm -hmm. there's no doubt that Mark Green was one of the hardest working elected officials in that position for a long time. I mean, he's a former NADA raider, mm -hmm. former consumer advocate, chair, uh, um, commissioner of consumer affairs under our Mayor Dinkins. Um, he was clearly qualified and had done eight good years as public advocate. Many folks thought that de Blasio could not beat uh, Mark Green. And John Liu, coming from a, what is considered a small demographic politically, a lot of folks felt that he would not be able to beat the one woman in the field, Melinda Katz, mm -hmm. or David Yasky, who many folks felt was the reformer candidate, right? Mm -hmm. He had the New York Times. He had most of the good government groups. He was considered, you know, he had Chuck Schumer on his side. Mm -hmm. He was considered the, the smart white liberal who folks thought would be, had the best ideas, quote unquote, for Comptroller, uh, while John Liu was clearly the hardest working, the most progressive. Mm -hmm the most focused on coalitions and had a strong history in communities of color that went back from his very first day as city councilman um, and a lot of folks and with that small Asian demographic a lot of folks felt that that wouldn't be enough he wouldn't be able to expand his base enough um, and clearly they were wrong now the electorate in New York City is predominantly minority yes, anyway sir. New York City is a predominantly minority community with some groups the uh, liberal whites yep. uh, Mm -hmm. the conservative whites, the uh, African Americans, somewhat split between Brooklyn and Harlem, yep. uh, and Queens, Southeast Queens, and the Latinos between the Bronx and Manhattan and Queens. Yes. So you have, as a political consultant, how do you go about putting this map together <laughs> to <laughs> figure out uh, which constituencies will go which way? Well, it, it's never easy. Uh, it's never easy. Um, it's a lot of hard work. Um, some luck, um, some in the right place at the right time stuff. Um, strong relationships are always key. Um, and having a candidate that's been on the right side of the right issues mm -hmm. time and time again makes it easier. Mm -hmm. um, now, you say the right side and the right issues, that means <laughs> to certain constituents. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Folks have to feel that the person that they're going to support, if they're not from their particular neck of the woods, mm -hmm. has stood by them on issues that matter most to them. Um, and at least, at least sometime. 
uh, and, and we were fortunate to have that in both cases this year. Now, if we see the map of New York City, yes. the uh, five boroughs, the Bronx being the only one that's attached to the mainland, the rest of them are islands, uh, how would you see this picture if you see African Americans, Latinos, Asians, whites, uh, how does it sp spill out in terms of the dem demography? I mean, it's constantly changing, constantly changing. It is, it, is a, it is an incredible demographic. I mean, from the very first race I did here in New York in 1994 compared to de till today, I mean, you have large pockets of African immigrants that have moved into Harlem, that have moved into Staten Island, that have moved in different pockets of the Bronx. You've got a whole swath of, of different Latino populations that have really, over the last 10, 15 years, whether it's uh, Mexicans in East Harlem, more and more Dominicans, not only in Washington Heights, but also into the South Bronx, um, Ecuadorians. I mean, it, the, the map has truly changed and continues to change. Um, and so no one strategy works for everywhere. What you really have to do is you have to talk about issues that, that matter across demographics. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be safe. Everybody wants to take care of their families. Everybody wants to have good jobs. Everybody wants to believe that the people they're going to support are going to do right by them and their families. So you start at a base, um, and you've got to have a real record. You've got to have a real record, which is something we found out with John Liu this last year in 2009. Because the one thing about John was folks felt although he was Asian, they, they felt that he connected to them, that he had fought on issues they cared about. Um, you know, folks, when they saw him in the street, they remembered him in the Sean Bell marches, mm -hmm. or they saw him at National Action Network, or they'd seen him fight for transportation issues, uh, the second set of books of the MTA. I mean, those were things that transcended race and transcended demographics that allowed folks to say he cares about me. Um, and I think Bill de Blasio, as chair of the General Welfare Committee, there were a lot of issues where he did the same exact thing, whether it's food stamps, whether it's living wage. Regardless, I think folks felt they could connect to those people individually, regardless of where they came from. Well, in, in January, the 15th Martin Luther King's birthday, yes, we think back to Martin Luther King in the 65 and 68, his death, and then all of the ferment that came about that. If King were alive today, how do you think he would view the political changes that have taken place with regard to African Americans? Well, I, I, think, I think he could not help but smile, right? Our first African American president, African Americans as the majority whips of the United States Congress, chairs of Ways and Means, chairs of some of the most major committees in Congress. But I think he'd also be somewhat sad in that we have we have a lot of communities where black folks and Latino folks are at each other's throats politically, uh, where once there was more of a much more coalition politics. I mean, the, the March on Washington doesn't happen without the support of so many people who were not just black. Um, and so our political power is, is both getting stronger and at the same time getting a bit weaker. Why? Is it because of numbers? I think a lot of it is numbers. I think a lot of it is numbers. And also the reality is we have not taken advantage as much as we should have as of our time on the stage. When We've had a lot of black elected officials who have come through this country in a lot of different ways and a lot of different places, and we have not necessarily moved forward as a community as much as I, as I, as I think he would have hoped we would have at this point. Now, when you say move forward as a community, <clears throat> we're concerned with jobs, we're concerned with housing, we're concerned with education, we're concerned with health care. Yep. Um, the economic situation of African Americans is still yes. not too good. The and I think, and I think that's family. where he'd be most sad with us. Well, all these elected officials that we've had and all these powerful positions, quote unquote, and we don't have more black home ownership at the level we should. We don't have more black entrepreneurship at the level that we should. Um, wh what withstands a recession is the ability to provide for your own employment and the employment of people that you care about in your community. And we don't have access to that in the way we should. That's why unemployment amongst our community is twice that of, of whites in this well, country. Well, this has to do with economic policy. Congressman Rangel has yes, done a number of things with the empowerment zone, tax credits, and yep. things like that. Uh, the other part of it, however, has to do with education. Yes, sir. To what extent has the black-white gap in education been narrowed and that relates to more than just teachers in the classroom. It relates to the nutrition. It relates Parents. to health care. It relates to class size. So uh, how can these 40-some African Americans in Congress really change something 
when there are 435 uh, <laughs> people that they're trying to influence. That's true. Well, I, I would think, I think it's the way in which th that they did when it came to the economic stimulus package, right? The Congressional Black Caucus bounded, binded themselves together and said, we're willing to vote for stimulus, but there has to be certain pieces in there, mm -hmm. right? That matter for the Apollo Theater, that matter for black car dealerships, mm -hmm. right? There were pieces that the Congressional Black Caucus said had to be part of the stimulus package that protected black businesses, mm -hmm. protected black business owners. And now they're trying to do another bill where they're trying to protect inner city, mm -hmm. um, you know, where they're trying to, you know, protect, um, you know, um, the black radio stations and black TV stations across the country. Those are the kinds of things that they can and are doing and can do more of and have to be supported by local mm -hmm. black elected officials on the ground. Um, there's nothing, wrong, there's nothing wrong with everybody getting some, as long as we're part of that some, too. Well, what about the conservative view that these so-called pork items mm. help to raise the deficit and don't improve the country? Uh, how do you answer that? Well, see, I, to me, the idea of pork items is ridiculous, mm. right? Because ha what some people consider pork is really good programs that you have to have in a community. A lot of what they consider pork items, you talk about little leagues, mm. You talk about uh, youth football leagues. Mm -hmm. You talk about rites of passage programs. Mm -hmm. You talk about boys and girls club. You talk about uh, Girl Scouts. I mean, a lot of these programs are part of what makes the fabric of young people's lives and people's lives in communities across this country good and mm -hmm. adds to the value of life. So, and it employs people. Uh, it's an economic engine. And so to me, I don't consider, look, some things clearly are waste. But 99.9% .9 of these things are about bettering the community. And what would you do with the? You'd have to spend that money on prisons if you didn't spend it on programs. Well, of course, the conservatives will say that private sector ought to fund them. You shouldn't depend on the government to fund it. Uh, how do you resolve that conflict in terms of thinking? Well, I, I think the private sector does a good job when the economy is good at giving money to programs that they feel they should support. But the government has a requirement to make sure that good programs are there for communities that need them and for the children and, and, and that has helped to support folks. And if you rely on the private sector, when times get bad, they're going to pull back those programs because they're about the private sector. They're about making a profit first and foremost. And so you cannot rely on those whose first priority is to make a profit to always provide for the people. It's just, it's just, it's just not consistent. Um, well, January 2010, a year of Barack Obama as the president. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you think he's done? He gave himself a B-plus the other day. What do you think? <laughs> well, I, I would give him a, I'd probably give him a B. I'd stay in that range. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's done a fantastic job with a horrible set of circumstances. Uh, but I would also say, and not, not as a criticism, but as a concern, I think he's taken on so many issues at, at one time that it's, ha it's hard to get all these things done at the same time. I mean, between a troop surge in Afghanistan, between health care, I mean, these are huge, huge, huge issues. Stimulus package, I mean, I mean you, the banking bailout, I mean, the, the issues are far, <laughs> far and few between. And... I think perhaps he should have taken on a few smaller things, got some victories first, um, and then built some political well, capital. What would, and have been, what would have been one of the smaller things he could have taken on? Well, I mean, I, I think there are a million small issues, right, from mm -hmm. child health care to yeah, he Head that. Start. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are, there, are a few, there are a few smaller bites at the apple that kind of go into the right direction, because I, I'm afraid with the health care package, and I know, this, uh, I know this may come after that, but I'm, I'm concerned that we get such a watered-down health care bill that do we, how, many, how many more people do we really serve, mm -hmm. and then do we have to try to go back at this thing again, uh, and how many people get left out? Um, but recall Obama's campaign. Yeah, yeah. The great campaign yes, almost sir. promised everything to every liberal, to every constituency. <laughs> Excellent communication, so expectations were high, 70%, 80% approval rate. Now it's down to below Jimmy Carter. Uh, as a political consultant, uh, what do you think about that strategy of promising everything to your constituents across the board, realizing that you're in a tough time? Now, you got elected, which was the first objective. True. But what do you think about uh, how do you maneuver from being the 
candidate on the white horse who's going to bring light to everyone to the reality of what's happening today. Well, it, it was look, he did exactly what he needs to do. After eight years of George Bush, after 9-11, after two protracted wars, he had, in order to win, you needed to be an aspirational candidate, right? Mm -hmm. People didn't just want a manager. They yeah. wanted somebody who made them believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and someone who would make them believe that where they were was not where they were going to be mm -hmm. in the near future. And he did a fantastic job. A he fantastic did a great job, job, but now he has to deliver. <laughs> <laughs> well, some, uh, sometimes an election does not, oh, you, you promise, you got to promise what people want, not as, even if it's a little bit more than you can necessarily deliver right away. Um, and I think he's doing a lot of it. He's mm -hmm. trying to do a lot of it. He I certainly mean, is. But as a political consultant, I'm, asking you, I want to run for office and I want to solve all the world's problems. What would you tell me in terms of putting those uh, objectives into perspective? Well, I, I would say in order to, you, you cannot govern if you don't win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's so, a, so, that's so, a consultant. Okay, go ahead. So sometimes you got to win and then we got to shape how you govern to get. But how do you do that? That's exactly, the, there's a certain amount of, of moral integrity, intellectual integrity behind this. Uh, that's one reason why the conservatives lose out because money they think don't have any integrity behind it. But if you're a liberal, you do want to have integrity, yet you want to change things. How would you go about advising a candidate to deal with that? Well, once once you get elected, once you get elected, my, my strategy has always been with the folks that I have worked with mm -hmm. is to get small victories, mm -hmm. to get small victories. Good strategy. Yeah. Because, because they add up. Mm -hmm. um, and they affect real people's lives mm -hmm. and pick issues that people can see real change mm -hmm. because sm it's hard to deliver on the big things if you don't have some small things that kind of back you up and build a track record where people believe mm -hmm. that if you say a certain thing is going to happen that it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Politics is a slow moving thing. Campaigns move quick. Campaigns are fast. They're mm -hmm. a four, six-month enterprise where you run the whole time. But once you govern, it's really, a, it's really, a, it's 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 really a marathon. It's not a race anymore. Mm -hmm. And so you have two years, four years to then try to make a real difference. And I think you have to take small things and build upon those because politics is the art of compromise when you're in government. I mean, it really is. You don't govern alone. You have to do it in the circumstances in which you find yourself. So I always believe take some smaller bites at the apple, get some victories for some people, change some people's lives in a very effective and positive way, and then you can begin to take on those bigger things. It doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen as quickly as people would like. There's no doubt about that. But that's why you need to affect some people's lives positively right away and in some real tangible ways. Let them hold on to some stuff. Let them feel change in their community, mm -hmm. in their neighborhood, in their lives, and they'll support you for the bigger things when the time comes. Now, what role does communication play in this? Uh, oral communication, internet communication, uh, television communication, what role is that? Because sometimes it's not the message, but it's the messenger and the way the messenger delivers the message. Uh, what kind of advice do you have in terms of communication? Well, I, I'll be very honest. I mean, it, that has been the most amazing thing that has taken place in the last five to six years in politics and government in, in this world that we live. Information gets out so quickly and in so many media. And sometimes so wrong. And so wrong. <laughs> that, that's very true. That's very true. I, I think the key is you got to have a real strategy for it. And you've got to talk to people in the language in which they speak. Right? Some people only get the information via the web, some folks only through print, some folks via radio, some folks via email. I mean, it's really a challenge now for politicians, for consultants, for everyone, mm -hmm. because you really have to distribute your message to every medium possible. And you have to open yourself to real questions from people perhaps you wouldn't have opened yourself to five years ago or definitely ten years ago because they're not the established medium of communication. I mean, you've got to spend time with bloggers. You've got to spend time with Internet folks. You've got to spend time with um, these political blogs. More people get the information that way as insiders in politics than they do through the, the news or through the print. I mean, subscriptions for papers are, are losing out every day. Papers are closing down across the country. But they're still powerful mediums. Uh, as, as we've seen in this last election alone, papers can make a difference. So you have to communicate in every medium possible, and you've got to be focused on it in a real way. And, and just because the medium is not something you necessarily respect or, or love does not mean you can't feed it. You've got to feed the beast, uh, as we say in politics. You well, let's feed take the, the beast. John Liu campaign. Yasky you, you had the Times and all the established people. How were you able to guide his campaign so that he could win? Well, 
John had a long, like I said, he was on the right side of the right issues for a long time. And well, we so focused. the other candidates, in well, part, yeah. Well, in part, uh, not necessarily. Melinda Katz, David Weppard, and David Yasky weren't at the National Action Network when Sean Bell's family was there. You know but what I mean? That has nothing to do with being controller. It doesn't, but it has to do about credibility. Okay. It has to do about credibility. It has to do with the fact that he connected with the audience in a way they didn't. Mm -hmm. He 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 mm -hmm. quote unquote was the black candidate mm -hmm. uh, in that race mm -hmm. and the minority candidate race. Not yeah. only because he was Asian, but because the issues he had fought sure. for in the council for so long were uh, issues that mattered to communities of color mm -hmm. for so long. And r we had we always knew that John would have an uphill battle as far as the Times and the Daily News and some of those other papers were concerned. So we spent more time with the local papers. John was endorsed by more local papers across the city than anybody except for They're Michael about Bloomberg. hundred local papers in the city. And John got 99% of them, mm -hmm. whether it was the Queen's Ledger, Carib Life, Carib News, Amsterdam News, Hoy, El Diario, mm -hmm. um, uh, the Singor Press, the, the Irish Eco, the Beacon, the Daily Challenge. Uh, now, we why did he get those? Because he spent time with them. Okay. He spent time with them, and and he cared about the issues they care about. Mm -hmm. And when he when they all went for these papers to get these endorsements, John had a record he could mm -hmm. point to, mm -hmm. and he talked about how he could use the Comptroller's Office as a progressive force in communities of color, mm -hmm. um, how he wanted to use that to make sure that every community got its fair share. Mm -hmm. um, and because of his background and his accomplishments, it had cr it, there was credibility there. Mm -hmm. um, and he spent time with them. He valued them. He didn't just say, if I don't get the news, if it's the times or nothing, as some of the other candidates did. He spent time with them. He showed them that they were important, that their audiences were important. Um, and as a consequence, they responded very effectively. And that's why on election night, when John won, he thanked about 30, 40 community papers mm -hmm. because he wanted to make sure that the other big papers understood mm -hmm. that Clearly, the New York Times matters. Clearly, the Daily News matters, right? Clearly, these papers matter, but these other papers matter, too, because they matter to people who live in this city in a real way. Now, uh, in explaining many of these complicated issues to the general public, there's a tendency to oversimplify. True. So how do you get a candidate to walk that middle ground between being forthright and direct, but at the same time not oversimplifying? Well, that, that, that's always a challenge. That's always a challenge. Um, and it, it, and every, for every candidate, it's slightly different. Um, you want to look at the strengths and weaknesses of that particular candidate um, and then shape a strategy that allows them to tell their story in the context of the audience they're dealing with so that folks can walk away feeling they know that candidate a little bit better and that they feel that person cares about or is concerned about the issues they're concerned about, whether that's environment, whether that's uh, minority women business enterprises, whether that's you know how investments are, are, are spent or food stamps or whatever it is. You want to weave a personal story, a personal, a, a personal experience, and some kind of accomplishment into every candidate's story for a particular audience, because that's how you really win them over, right? They want to know who you are. They want to know what you'll do for them, and then if you have a track record of delivering. Right, because that's what's important. Well, 2010 is going to be a challenging year for the Democrats. It is. For all elected officials, midterm elections. Yes. What's your prediction? You think the Democrats will hold on to their majority? I think they'll, uh, certainly they'll be cut into, but it's very thin anyway. What's your prediction? What do you think the issues will be that influence that? Well, I, I think health care is going to be a big issue. I think the Republicans have, have focused in on it, saying that anyone who votes for it, it's going to be a big issue. Um, and, and uh, you because seen, they think it'll cost too much. They think it'll cost too much. And they be, and you see these ads that come on at midnight and one o'clock about fight socialized medicine and Obama's a communist and all this kind mm -hmm. of stuff. In some parts of this country, that stuff still works. Mm -hmm. Um, and as you can see, several Democrats across the country who live in red states, from Tennessee to Missouri, incumbent Democrats have decided not to seek re-election re this year, next year, uh, what, 2010. So do you think that uh, the Democrats will lose their majority? I do not. I think, that, I think, I think you're right that they will get the, the majority cut into, but I do not believe they'll lose the majority. I don't. Um, I think in the end, once they do pass health care, um, and I do think the economy starts to turn around in the new year. I think that would be a, that would be a good thing for them, but they will lose some seats. Mm -hmm. Because let's be honest, there are some seats that they won that a lot of folks thought that they wouldn't, mm -hmm. right? Seats that either McCain won or McCain mm -hmm. was very close in winning mm -hmm. or that George Bush had won both two times before. Some of those seats 
that the Democrats won. They were very, they're very, they're lean, Republican leading seats. That's a difficult thing to hold on to in, t in tough economic times. Now, as a political consultant, when you help a candidate to craft their campaign, how do you determine which issue is going to be the main one that they advance as they promote themselves? Well, I, I think you've got to look at their particular level of accomplishments, mm -hmm. right? You've got to look at what they have done, Good. right? Then what is the office or thing that they're running for, and how does their accomplishments match up with that? Mm -hmm. And then what is their vision of that office once they would get it. If, they were, if they're going to be public advocate, what do they want the public advocate to do? And so you have to look at those three things, put them, you sit at a table with some smart people and, and, and develop the three, the four, the five things that they're going to focus on saying that is credible, right? Mm -hmm. Because the reality is if you, if you say you're going to do something and you have no history of doing anything mm -hmm. along those lines, people know BS when they hear it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so you've got to, it's got to be grounded in reality. It's got to be grounded in credibility. Um, and so then you craft that message with and all that information. in order to be a good political consultant, you have to let them know that. Yes, <laughs> yes. Today I, on African American <laughs> Legends, we've been talking with Kevin Wardell, a political consultant, about the whole spectrum of politics in America, politics in New York City, and politics in Harlem. Thanks for being with us today, Harlem. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown.